are joined by Barbara Bukowska, who's a human rights activist and attorney, and she's a senior director for law at policy and policy at Article 19, uh, which is an international free speech organization. And she's particularly known for her work on the racial discrimination of Romani people in the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And Barbara is also on the board of trustees for the Center for Investigative Journalism. And we're also joined by David Rose, who's an investigative journalist uh, and the author of seven books. He's a writer for the Daily Mail, and he's also been published by The Guardian, Sunday Times, Vanity Fair, and many, many others. Um, David won Reporter of the Year at British Press Awards in 2015 and Feature Writer of the Year in 2018. Um, so uh, I want to talk about uh, you know, whether in the wake of coron the coronavirus pandemic, um, we've increasingly basically tried to lock down debate in, in the West and, and whether the crisis is not just being exploited by the kind of authoritarian governments uh, around the world, but also by big tech and democratic governments. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, thinking particularly in a pandemic where public trust is so important, where do we actually draw the line in terms of censorship and free speech? Um, so I thought perhaps a good place to start with this was talking about big tech um, because mm -hmm. Obviously, since the, the very start of this pandemic, social media companies have been very, very active in dealing with uh, what you might call fake news, disinformation, conspiracy theories. Um, you've got QAnon, the 5G conspiracy theory, the anti-vax movement, etc. cetera. Um, so I suppose as ever, there is a kind of sliding scale of fake news, if you like. At one end, we have the most vile and dangerous content. And I think, you know, let's, let's be in no doubt that how bad it can get. You know, many, many of these conspiracy theories are kind of based on racism and anti-Semitism. And uh, obviously a lot of it seeks to undermine the response to coronavirus um, in a way that arguably could prolong the pandemic. But as well as that, social media companies have also cracked down on a kind of broader spectrum of what they sometimes call medically unsubstantiated content. And, and I think it's this really that I'd like to talk about first. Um, so, um, Barbara, let, let, let's start with, with you. Is this in kind of intervention by tech companies uh, in, in on medically unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated content? Is, is this a cause for concern or should we actually be relieved that, you know, after pressure from politicians both sides of the, the Atlantic, these companies are actually dealing with this issue seriously and thoroughly? I would hesitate to say that these companies are dealing with this issue thoroughly and comprehensively, right? And I think that we also need to see this issue around coronavirus or like what the companies do in really context of the digital ecosystem, right? So you can't separate what these companies do on the coronavirus from everything else, right? So number one problem of the companies is that we have few companies which are, let's say, dominant on the market, right? So we have like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and maybe, you know, in YouTube, and then in some countries also others who really dominate the digital market. So they have a huge power over what people can say, what can they do, and obviously they are, there is also a pressure on them. So in this situation, when we are in crisis, giving them even more power to decide what we can say, what, what, what we can't say is a problem, right? So that's number one. Number two is that also how they define certain issues in their community guidelines or in their terms of service is also problematic, right? And so even like how you define disinformation or how you, how you define what is medically substantiated is an issue, right? So if you look at, for example, at the beginning of coronavirus, masks, right? Uh, the BBC and, you know, even World uh, Health Organization, they were saying masks is a big no-no because people don't know how to wear it, there was a shortage and whatever. And they were actually removing information about the masks. Now, mask is, you know, default. Everybody should wearing a mask. So what is medically substantiated information can change in time. It's not set in stone. Or even science is not set in stone. Look at, like, history of science, like, uh, earth was uh, flat was a science at some point right so even in this kind of like really complex and fast changing information you do not really it's, it's very difficult to pin down what is medically substantiated at certain point of view and obviously as you said in your introduction there are certain information which are done right like coronavirus moves in with droplets and so on but 
the, the all everything around it it's not set in stone so giving them a power to decide what what can be removed and what is a science is a problem right and then another problem on the companies is their business model because the business model is based on clickbait right it's based on monetization of people's individual data and what they do online so because they want to monetize certain content more you click on certain content more money they can make of it so if we look at how this, this business and how this ecosystem works obviously we have a problem in coronavirus as kind of situation so hailing them as a like finally waking up to something it's a bit problematic because you are basically asking for something which is a huge issue and giving these companies even more power in this situation is a problem for me and for any human rights or free speech activists as such. Um, David, um, what, I mean, what do you make of this? Do you, surely they have to do something, the social media companies, you know, and presumably, you know, the, what they would say is, um, you know, we're in an exceptional time now with this pandemic and exceptional times call for exceptional measures. Well, you know, the thing is, most people nowadays communicate online. So if you write something on social media, uh, it's not really that different from uh, writing on paper and posting it to somebody in, in decades and centuries gone by. Nobody ever suggested that um, the people who make paper should censor the content of what people wrote on it. But that is now what we seem to be uh, finding acceptable for big tech to do. And the point is, you know, one person's disinformation, one person's medically uh, uh, challengeable uh, fake news is actually perhaps in another person's eyes, completely acceptable scientific information. Now, add to that the extraordinarily, mono the, the, the extraordinary monopolization of the narrative in, in, in certainly the United Kingdom uh, by a particular perspective, um, I think exemplified most by BBC coverage. And I think you have a problem. The BBC has from day one uh, emphasized nothing but COVID deaths, death rates, so-called cases, when actually what we're talking about is positive tests, when you know, many of these cases, so-called cases of people without any symptoms. And with that narrative, which began in the early weeks with what I would call COVID porn, endless scenes of people in hospital suffering and dying again and again and again, basically to induce a sense of fear in people and huge issues become almost untouchable. And I you know, include in this the huge collateral damage, which is only now becoming really apparent, the, the damage to mental health and other kinds of physical health and let alone, of course, the economic damage. And all of this was cast in a very simplistic light and continues to be so, I think, from, from many media outlets in the UK. Now, in that context, social media is one of the few places where people can challenge that narrative, where people can dissent. And if you start imposing censorship on that dissent, I think you are on an extraordinarily slippery slope. Yes, it is an exceptional period, but this does not justify the adoption of uh, a level of censorship, which I think will be very hard to get rid of. Now, I personally have no time whatsoever for anti-vaxxers. I despise anti-vax arguments. Uh, two years ago, um, I ran a successful campaign to extend human papillomavirus uh, to, to boys, which was who were being discriminated against. However, the way to counter anti-vaxxers is by counter arguments, by evidence, not by silencing them. If you silence them, silence them, all you do is feed their conspiracy theories. So I find the whole move to let social media uh, platforms, the paper of the modern world, determine content absolutely terrifying and utterly deplorable. And I think it has, has to be resisted uh, by all means. So I, I think- Martin, you know, but you know, Martin, may, let me correct uh, something which you asked because you said that uh, co these companies need to do something, right? Because they are extraordinary. I'm not, that's not my view, I'm just saying. Yeah, but you know, obviously like they, we, we are not saying that there should be, you know, incitement to hatred online or any other kind of undesirable content there. 
But the problem there is that they are having, governments are now increasingly ordering the companies to remove certain content, which is like poorly defined or which is like very broad and, and very vague. So there is a discrepancy between what is really removed and lack of consistency, which is creating confusion. That's number one. Number two is then also we need to have a societal discussion about the role of these companies, right? So it's not that they should be deciding themselves. So some sort of like an oversight over them through independent sort of mechanisms, which we have a history of, and have a little bit more control and accountability over what these companies are doing and transparency. And what, what they do now, mm -hmm, go ahead. Well, I, I think that, sorry, I should just clarify that I'm, not putting any of my own views over uh, either way. I'm, I'm just trying to kind of provoke a debate here. But um, I presume that, you know, Facebook and Twitter would say they have independent fact checkers who come in and do this. You know, it's not Mark Zuckerberg sat at home deciding what's scientific evidence and what's not. It's independent. But, but this, is, this is something which is completely unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, also, you know, yeah. Twitter and Facebook, it is not their job to have fact checkers. If I publish a magazine or a newspaper, it's my job. I, I need to ensure there are fact checkers. If I am making money from a publication, then, you know, there should be sub editors and fact checkers and of course reporters, you know, there is a tremendous uh, onus to make sure we get things right. But for Twitter and Facebook to employ fact checkers, who are these fact checkers? What is their training? What is their background? What standards are they applying? Now, let me give you a concrete example. So um, I have uh, talked quite a lot over the last few weeks to a new group in Britain called Recovery. And it's called uh, Recovery for Balance. And in other words, it's, it's, it's really not very controversial. It is simply arguing that there should be a more balanced policy response to coronavirus. It says that it is not enough only to look at death rates, infection rates, and so forth. We need to consider the issues in their totality. And that includes, you know, allowing people to visit their loved ones in care homes. It, it means allowing uh, people uh, with suitable uh, measures of social distancing to, to go to restaurants and preserve the hospitality sector of the, of the economy, and so on, the whole, the whole nine yards. Now, they have had, social media posts and YouTube videos censored. This is monstrous. They're not propagating any disinformation or fake news. This is just presenting an alternative perspective. And there are now 70 members of the, of the House of Parliament, of the House of Commons, who formed a separate group, but they've interestingly used the same name, the recovery group of MPs. So are we going to find Twitter and Facebook censoring their messages? This is just not acceptable. It is absolute suppression of free speech at a time when frankly we need it more than any other and this is another point i really want to emphasize the flow of information is so controlled at the moment mm -hmm. and this has such devastating consequences for the social media giants for the big tech giants to be suppressing free speech with so-called fact checkers it is a mortal threat to to the whole notion of free speech Martin, but regardless of like what is the right uh, uh, response to, to coronavirus, whether it's lockdown or something, and we can have opinions about that, but in this particular case, it's not, it's not, they, not, it's not flag, flag checkers, they call it independent flaggers, right, who flag the cons, uh, content for them, which uh, we need to see as, as smart, sorry, as David said, like who they are, how they are trained and so on. But the, the bigger problem is also that a lot of the content which is removed is based on algorithm, right? So it's automated decision making. And these companies now admit it, they have been doing this for a long time, but now they admit it because a number of the content and also a lot of their, their moderators or those who are like re deciding about removal of content have been furloughed or they have been, uh, they are not able to work for Facebook or Twitter or whoever. So they rely more and more on aut automation an automated removal, which is a big problem because the, the problematic content often is context-based, right? And uh, so sometimes it's a joke which might be removed or it can be satire, it can be critical. So algorithm can very rarely differentiate the content in a context or also what is the intent of the person who is posting it. So for this, you need a human reviewer. 
but also these human reviews, they need to be based in the communities, right? Because if I'm a human reviewer for something which is in you know, Kenya or Myanmar, and even if I speak the local language, if I don't know the local content, uh, local context and local situation, it's very difficult for me to make the decisions. So these companies who are making a lot of money on data and who are like really exploiting the, the, the data as a new capital, they are not investing enough into the way how to do this properly. And that's a problem. And then also what, what David said, the governments are here a problem because we have this, this really very, very complex and very confusing situation. And what the information the government is communicating is often very inadequate. It's not proactively disclosed. So you don't know on the, what basis is government making decisions, right? And uh, who are they listening, how they are, balancing these decisions they are making. So information backing is huge. And then also how they, this information is communicated, right? Is it through friends? Is it bringing communities along, right? Like nobody wants to die of coronavirus, right? But like if you want to sustain these measures in the long run, you need to bring people along. You need to like motivate them in a certain way rather than like threats of asking people to report on their neighbors, right? So this is kind of, horrible situation where George Orwell is weeping in his grave over this kind of like measures which the UK government put forward. So you, you can't disconnect the measures of these big companies with the, with the information policy the governments uh, are running and how they are communicating. And then also uh, the David already touched on the problem of the media, like what is balanced coverage, what is diverse coverage, all this military language in coverage of coronavirus, it's a war and, you know, front line and, you know, kind of um, problematic language in terms of, of uh, how, the, how to inform the population. So then you really question whether decisions are made on the basis of proper informed, you know, citizenry, or is it on a whim or on kind of like who screams most? So that's the problem. So just keep it, keeping to the, the issue specifically of, um, social media companies, or big tech, if we just look at the implications of, of what they're doing, is this simply a matter of principle or is it possible that uh, by censoring, by deleting content, they might actually be, um, they might actually be having the exact opposite effect of what they want in the sense that this could feed the conspiracy theories and it perhaps could you know, am amplify and, and, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this is what you want, isn't it? You want Facebook and, and Twitter to, to delete your, your content. That shows that the establishment is against you. Do, you. do you think it could actually make the situation worse? Well, you know, it could do, but, but that is not my chief concern. I, I think the chief concern is, is that there is, um, a lack of debate and a lack of reliable information and I think that by uh, indulging in censorship uh, the the social media companies are making that worse um, and I, I think you know they are completely unaccountable they are the you know they are the Rockefeller uh, trusts of, 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 of the present time and um, uh, I think their influence and power has become disproportionate and uh, extremely, extremely dangerous, and, and they're now just proving it. But how about an instance like um, with well, with Donald Trump? Last month, uh, he he tweeted that um, coronavirus was far less lethal than the flu, um, which, of course, we know that is not true. Um, should people be allowed to, you know, should we say to the, you know, should the public be allowed to know that the president of America is, is wrong and have that out there so that we can see his lies and see his misinformation? Well, or, or, you know, surely... Of course we should. But, but, but is it not... How, could also, we not? How should that not be acceptable? Uh, but, Martin, I mean, but also, is it, is it not... Uh, and again, I'm not putting forward uh, an opinion here, but... From Twitter's point of view and Facebook, how can they have this you know, person with millions of followers putting out information which is potentially damaging, potentially, you know... Damaging? But, but, well, but in, in a sense, it might... Yeah, I agree with you, Martin, that obviously we need to have a proper 
community guidelines, what people can say online and how this is done is to be discussed because there is certain content which can lead to a certain danger, right? Like, you know, on coronavirus as well as other issues, like look at the genocide in Myanmar, right? Which was very much um, due to Facebook posts or like last week when there was this killing of a teacher in France, the former president of Malaysia put some tweet which was really inciting other Muslims to go and, and kill others, right? So this kind of content can really lead to this incitement to violence against certain groups. So in these situations, like uh, when there is a proper assessment of that content, these companies are perfectly, you know, legitimate, but also obliged to remove this content, right? But how is this done? Is cannot be just let on them, right? So that's why like organization like Article 19, we advocate for a better oversight mechanism over these companies. And it's not just the removal, because uh, removal is one part of the problem. There is something also called content curation, so it's how they rank the visibility on their uh, on your like when you go to your twitter or when you go to your facebook page what you see what they prefer how how they prefer what or how they curate and target the content to you right which is based against an algorithm where we have zero transparency over so uh, each of our facebook page if you have facebook would look very different right even if we have the same friends right so we need transparency also on this aspect. So basically we need transparency over the whole conduct of these companies. What they remove, what they curate, how they decide, what is this uh, algorithm based on, and then how these rules which they adopt, how they are enforced. So the transparency here, but also see them as a part of the, of the, of the all, all the ecosystem of the information we are now. Like you can't say like, it's just the companies it's also the government and what governments tell them to do. Because something they do on their own volition, but something they do because the government says, tells them, if you don't remove this content within 24 hours or within two hours in some countries, you are gonna be fine, right? So then when you don't have uh, the conditional liability or if you don't have the, the immunity from liability, they are obviously gonna err on the side of caution and remove a lot of content. So it's, it's more complex than it looks like. So I think that's an interesting point about, um, you know, you were saying about, yes, it's okay for them to remove things when there is a direct and known, you know, threat to someone's life or something like that. You know, you talk about my, Myanmar. Um, now, to, to play devil's advocate here, is it not possible that, for instance, with something like the, um, the anti-vax movement, that there could hypothetically be a situation where this becomes so widespread that the introduction of a vaccine, uh, so, so many people will refuse to take a vaccine out of you know, unsubstantiated fears that this vaccine will not work effectively. But you know, is that, is that it, not it, then when social media companies should step in? You're, you're, you're making it sound like it's a simple black and white decision, but it's not. Mm. So f first of all, just, just picking up Barbara's point here. I mean, you know, incitement, you know, the, the incitement offered by the former uh, Prime Minister of, of Malaysia uh, as a result of, 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 of the uh, publication again of, of the cartoons of Muhammad. Um, that's a criminal offence in most jurisdictions. So if somebody is tweeting what amounts to incitement to go and kill French people, that's, that's, that has crossed a very clear line. A, a criminal offence has been committed. It's, it's but most of authority like a former prime minister or pro former yeah. president and so yeah but you know wh when it comes to something like vaccination it's not so clear cut so okay just put vaccines to one side for a second in the last few days we have seen in the united kingdom an enormous propaganda campaign by the government in support of these so-called rapid tests these uh, lateral flow tests which are a little bit like pregnancy tests so you, you use either saliva or a swab uh, which is then sort of put in solution and then you dip the, the thing in and a line appears if, if there's coronavirus. Okay, we've been told this is the, this is the so-called Operation Moonshot. The government has already spent 440 billion, sorry, million on, on one particular firm's tests and it's about to spend another billion and it's distributing them everywhere and it's saying that this will enable you to go and talk, uh, to, to go and see your, your, your relatives in, in care homes or you know, elderly people living at home because you'll be able to do your coronavirus test, find your negative and go and see them. Well, this is problematic because these tests are not very sensitive. Now I published an article on, 
on Saturday morning, which uh, spoke to a group of people who've had almost no attention paid to them, either by the government or by the media since this whole thing began, who are arguably the people best qualified to, to make judgments about many aspects of it, namely consultant virologists working in National Health Service hospitals, running very sophisticated laboratories, which have been largely disregarded because the government set up its own parallel operation. And they are saying these tests are potentially extremely dangerous because they're not very sensitive. They have what's called a low, sorry, a, a relatively high, what's called um, limit of detection. Now, this is to get slightly technical, but it, 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 if it, 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 the, the, the LOD, the limit of detection, refers to how many viral particles you will find in, in, in a milliliter of solution to be detected by a test. Now, the, the particular tests that, that they spent all this money on in the UK, according to the manufacturer's own uh, you know, accompanying leaflet, it, it says it's 425. Now, that's quite hard quite a lot of virus and you could be at the beginning of an infection which will soon increase massively and you could be very infectious very soon after or even at that time with that limit of detection there's an alternative test on the market which is being used in germany with great success the limit of detection of this test is 14. in other words it's a whole order of magnitude more sensitive uh, but we are spending money on this cheaper test which might expose people to risk. Now, okay, that is about testing, it's not about vaccine. But if there were to emerge legitimate concerns about a particular vaccine, or the way it's being administered, are you going to say that social media companies should silence this dissent? Supposing, for the sake of argument, hypothetically, one of the vaccines which has just declared that it's having fantastic results, evidence emerges that actually they're not nearly as fantastic as we thought and actually people in the trial got seriously enough to taking the vaccine would social media companies stop you reporting that should investigative journalists if they should acquire information of that kind publish it my answer is of course they should it would be a huge public duty so this is why i'm saying you know, yes, there could be dangers from an anti-vax campaign, but does that mean, I mean, who is going to moderate between well-founded investigative reporting about the dangers of a particular vaccine and ill-founded fake news about a vaccine? It's not, a, not an easy distinction. Surely there is a distinction. There, perhaps there is a blurred line in the middle, but there is a distinction between, on the one hand, a peer-reviewed scientific study and someone sat at home you know, without any scientific training, someone who's not an investigative journalist, anything like that, um, just making stuff up about vaccines. And, and sure, there might be, a, you know, a few cases in the middle where it's kind of, you know, slightly unclear as to which, which side of the boundary they fall. But the point is that no one is trying to say that scientists shouldn't be able to debate and, you know, that there shouldn't be scientific disagreement. But this is something else, isn't it? But are you, are you seriously suggesting that to post on social media on certain subjects, if you're not taking the mainstream narrative, you have to prove that you have scientific qualifications that enable you to do this, that you have to show your PhD in microbiology or whatever? Because I'm, I'm afraid, you know, the whole thing about free speech is you have to disagree with people. And sometimes people do say rubbish on free, free speech. Yes, uh, you know, incitement, clearly, that we abhor incitement. Racism, we abhor racism. But sometimes people talk nonsense, they talk rubbish. And I'm afraid free speech means you have to let them. But uh, Martin, also, like, if you remove a lot of this information, a lot of this content, you also deprive people actually commenting on it and challenging it, right? So, uh, and you also, because it's not just like people are posting their opinion, they're also sharing information, right? They're sharing articles, they're sharing whatever. And then now some, some of these companies and also state can respond to it and say that there was at some point there was a sharing of, a, of some articles when people were blowing the, the fan down their nose. So to like kind of dry, <laughs> hair dry their noses and whatever. And that was actually dangerous, right? So like, you know, people can say like, don't, don't say that, don't share this post and, and so on. So, and it's, <laughs> It's, it's actually the, the gray areas are, are much more numerous than you think. So the extremes are actually quite, quite the, the, 
the boundaries are, are not as clear as you're de describing them. So we need to have a societal discussion about it. And also, that's why the media, like mainstream media, are more important now, right? And a lot of them succumbed to this kind of narrative and, you know, click by like headings, which are kind of manipulative and so on, so to ensure the click by so what is the information ecosystem we want in the future is a subject for discussion and it should not be decided by the companies or few. That's my point. And these are, these are problems like none of us is denying that this is not a problem, right? What, what is on, on happening on the internet and there is a lot of rubbish and so, but the responses we see also from the company, from the governments, like in the UK, they have this proposal on online harms, right? And also in the EU now, there's this discussion about the Digital Service Act, which is supposed to like regulate this problem, right? And the problem there is to give the companies more power. So there are other, like we need to look at other systems and other mechanisms, which are probably much more free speech friendly. So my organization, we are, I already mentioned, we advocate for this um, social media oversight systems. We also call for unbundling the services of the companies, so partially break the monopolies. So some ex ante measures from competition regulation to break the, the monopolies they have, but also give more competition in the market, right? So it would not be like a couple of them, but you would have a more competition for content moderation. So there are other measures which we need to take into solutions rather than just censorship. I think, I mean, you know, Twitter first really came to prominence people realized the power of twitter in 2009 during the so-called green revolution in iran when um as you recall there was, there was a disputed election result the the more liberal party uh, had uh, power uh, denied it by unjust means and people took to the streets and of course many thousands were eventually arrested some were tortured some were executed but for a, for an extraordinary period at, at a point where most people had never heard of twitter suddenly twitter was the way in which people in iran and outside iran were finding out what was really happening and it became the most extraordinary vehicle for uh you know something that came quite close to to a revolution in a very oppressive authoritarian state what is happening now is that governments are partnering with twitter to enforce certain messages this is appalling. This, this is a negation of the freedom and possibility which Twitter and other social media appeared to open up when they started. And I think it has to be resisted with, with every means. How about um, what Twitter have been doing, uh, I think particularly recently, I know they've been doing it in, in, in relation to Trump's claims about the election, and I suspect they've been doing it uh, with coronavirus claims, which is to not delete it, but to simply add a message saying this is disputed. Is there a halfway house here where we can, you know, on the one hand, satisfy free speech without, you know, closing down, as you say, dissenting voices and even people spouting nonsense. But on the other hand, trying to restore some sense of sanity to the debate. Well, it's, it's not about sanity. What you're asking is for the, for the social media giants to become nannies. Um, everyone knows that just about everything that Donald Trump says is disputed. You know, look at the Washington Post and, and their sort of constant running tally of the untruths he's told. I mean, it's all out there. Um, it's easy enough to establish that, you know, in fact, coronavirus has a higher infection fatality ratio than flu does and is therefore more dangerous than flu. People know this, they're getting this. You don't have to say warning, nanny Twitter says, oh, Donald Trump might not be telling the truth here. Because if he's not, then challenge what he says with the truth. That's a different point, isn't it? Whether Twitter is being a nanny or not is different from whether they're shutting down free speech. It's not, it's not for Twitter to say something is in dispute. It's for other Twitter users to say, hold on, this is wrong because. Well, you know, the, I mean, let's, let's, uh, I, I wouldn't be so extreme. Like, you know, these companies, they also have a social responsibility to protect human rights. And if some content can lead to some really dangerous result, it is their, actually their responsibility to moderate the content according to their terms of, terms of service and community guidelines. So, so putting something which is disputed, it's not, uh, it's a better measure than like removal and ability to challenge in particular situation which you just you just described 
but I think that the, what is in the core of this discussion about the coronavirus actually is, but also on other measures, we put too much emphasis on technological solution, right? So you think the technology is gonna solve our social problems. They are gonna, if, if you sense that this information, it's gonna be perfect. Everybody will get vaccinated and coronavirus will get you know, eliminated and so on. Solutions are not that simple. So in terms of particular public health, which we have now, the problem is that there is a poor healthcare system, which is hit by austerity and which is not functioning properly. So the, the focus on the, on the technical measures might be distracting to these other problems or thinking that when we have technological solution, everything will be solved, right? There was this issue of apps a couple months ago, but still the coronavirus apps, the contact tracing app or, or the um, quarantine apps and so on. So again, we, we need to see underlying social problems which are leading to a lot of these issues and have solutions there as well rather than just in technology. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Move on from the, from the question of the tech giants because I, I, I absolutely agree with what you say there. And you know, in, in Britain, the, the, the problem is that the, the statements made by the British government over months now, I mean, frankly, they, they make Donald Trump sometimes look like a sort of paragon of truthfulness. Um, and, you know, we have heard so much rubbish, world beating, test and trace and all the rest of it when they were, you know, trialing some dodgy app created in a few weeks in the Isle of Wight that, you know, essentially didn't work at all. And even the app they have got now is, is fraught with all kinds of problems. And uh, as I revealed in, in, the, in the paper at the weekend, they turned down a, a fantastic solution from a group of, of, of you know, internationally known uh, scientists who, who had an app that would have worked a great deal more effectively and preserve privacy and also enable much more data to be gathered and so on. But the fundamental problem in Britain is the way in, the, in which the government controls information, not just in the coronavirus crisis, but in general, has got more and more repressive. Now, I, I remember the, the days before the 2010 election when you could contact a government press office and you could actually ask questions and get answers. You know, questions that started with phrases like, how many, uh, what is, and, and you, you would actually get facts and then you would ask for a comment and they would address the point you were making. And they would also quite often fix up briefings with senior officials who would tell you more, perhaps on an off the record basis. Nowadays, most interactions with government press offices have come to this. So you submit a series of questions asking very specific points and asking for comment on them. And after a long, long delay, usually long after the deadline that you specify, you get an incredibly bland statement, which basically says, this government is, com is committed to providing the best sliced bread in the world and is continuing to provide the best sliced bread in the world. And if you, uh, choose to think otherwise it's your problem and essentially no information is given up given out nothing is denied nothing is confirmed you get a bland statement of policy that will often go all the way up if you have asked some difficult questions to the minister's special advisor who will have to sign off on what are called the lines this is an incredibly authoritarian approach to, to information, and it's worse than ever in the coronavirus crisis, but it's essentially a continuation of something that's been going on for a long time now. Um, basically a refusal to have any sort of dialogue, to do anything other than give out messages which you can take or leave. And, yeah. and Martin, we, we also didn't touch one of the issue because there is also, Another problem which you have in connection to the tech giants or to, what, to those social media platforms is also what we call it Article 19 right to be heard, right? So because that you have a lot of harassment, a lot of silencing people online and, you know, journalists, female journalists and all kinds of like harassment and bullying and kind of nasty, nasty language which is not removed so swiftly as some information. So there's a big discrepancy between what companies remove and on how and, and what they judge like uh, okay and what they don't emphasize. So we need to have a conversation about this as well because it's a huge, huge, huge inconsistency between what they do and some content they immediately remove. And if you are a female journalist trying to like, we even have the campaign at Article 19 called Missing Voices for like censoring of like minority views online because they don't fit certain prescribed um, 
let's say like even sexuality or like you know ecosystem of nudity if it's artistic it's removed as well so missing voices online is also a problem in terms of free art expression you're right it has only in that, that kind of style has only increased through the pandemic i mean how do you how should the government weigh this up because you know we, we all know that public the public message is, is important you know uh, particularly in the pandemic it, it, through a lockdown for instance it is you know arguably very important that people are on side they know the rules all this stuff otherwise the lockdown simply won't work as effectively you know uh, clearly it, it, from your perspective it, it's not working very well at the moment how, how do you allow these two two things to, to play out well the need to get across messages on on, on the lockdown well, I mean, the first point is that I'm totally opposed to the lockdown. Um, and so I don't want them to get their message out without challenge. And one of the things that depresses me most is that the way that those messages, the only kind of interaction you get now is with political correspondents and, and the journalists who attend these farcical number 10 briefings where certain reporters, some of them working for very well-known television channels, who seem to adore the sounds of their own voices, grandstand and preen and ask extraordinarily easy questions which they think are frightfully clever and which allow ministers and the prime minister quite often and and the likes of the, the scientific advisors and so forth to get off the hook easily so you know what we actually have is is a slow erosion of trust because more and more people are waking up to this and more and more people realize that the damage they see to the society all around them is not going to be reversed very easily or very quickly uh, so, but, but, you know, what we are actually losing sight of is the very concept of democratic accountability. If the government will not engage, if it will not answer specifics at all, you are in big trouble. Now, let me tell you something I happen to know. As we know, Dominic Cummings has now departed the government. He left um, last week. He had a plan uh, to abolish all government press offices. He wanted to replace the entire government press operation with a gigantic call center, which would simply process questions from journalists. But you know, the people involved clearly would not be across the policy areas involved at all. How could they be? So, you know, you would, you would email or phone a person who was part of this great call center and ask a question of perhaps quite a technical nature relating to the pandemic, which should go to somebody in, in the Department of Health and Social Care. And, you know, somebody who might never have dealt with that subject ever before would be handling it. It was a way of almost formally abolishing the idea that there would be a sort of engagement, a, a, a sense of, 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 of replying to questions. And, and I think this is, I mean, you know, Dominic Cummings has gone, I hope this plan doesn't come to pass. But at, at the same time, the fact that, that he could conceive of such a thing as a way of perhaps saving some money and also increasing the centralization and, 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 and the, you know, the messaging, as it's always called, um, is, is terrifying. So, so what do you think the actual implication of that is? And for, for both of you, you know, the, you know, David, you said you're against the lockdown. Do you think that there is a broader point here about how we've moved into this, uh, we seem to have moved into this world where people are for or against a lockdown, but actually there is very little debate about what do we actually mean by that? You know, have we had a cost benefit analysis of a lockdown? What are the, uh, what are the costs, what are the benefits? How, and and presumably different lockdowns can be less or more effective in different circumstances and different, you know, you know Nor would you debate the, 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 those questions. I mean, you know, to take one example, gyms are closed. There is evidence from the NHS contact tracing app that gyms account for almost no coronavirus infections. Um, in fact, according to um, uh, uh, Active UK, which is an organization that represents gyms, uh, in the four months that gyms were open between the end of the first lockdown and the start of the second, um, there were 40 million gym visits in the UK and uh, there were less than 100 cases of, of infection from those gyms. So we are talking about the tiny problem. The health 
of millions of people, 10 million people in this country belong to gyms, is now in danger. It's winter. Boris Johnson breezily says, oh, go and take some exercise outside. Well, I don't know about where you live, but where I live in Oxford, the places where I did go on, you know, runs and walks uh, in, in the spring and the summer are now a mud, a mud quagmire or flooded because the Thames, is, as it always does at this time, has burst its banks. Well, how is it healthy? How is it going to help people resist coronavirus not to be able to exercise, which is what closing gyms does? How is that a justifiable measure? Will you find that debated in the BBC? Will you hear it discussed on the Today programme? For that matter, debated you know, in the pages of the Daily Mirror or the Guardian? You certainly won't. And will you, if you, if you engage somebody from the Department of Health and Social Care and ask them, well, could you give me a, a justification for uh, closing gyms? Then you'll get your we are the best thing since sliced bread, our lockdown is the best thing since sliced bread, now shut up and stop asking difficult questions. Um, uh, Martin, so, like, I, I think that's not, I mean, t for me, like, okay, I work for a free speech organization, so I'm not gonna say, like, whether all lockdown is better than lo no lockdown or wh whatever, I, I mean, it's not, not my expertise, and I'll, also not a behavior psychologist to say, like, who, what influences what, but what we have here is that the need for really proactive disclosure of information and comprehensive information, as we said before. You know, it's not just in the UK, in other countries around the world. So, so right to information needs to be basis of any of the government policies. And the second is that when we restrict human rights in the context of coronavirus pandemic or any public health crisis, there are certain standards in international human rights framework, which tells us how to restrict these rights, right? They need to be set in the law. They need to be really pursuing a legitimate aim, okay? In this case, public health. But they also need to be necessary and proportionate to the aim sought, right? And uh, for freedom of expression, we really need to see whether some of these restrictions are really necessary and whether the same objective can be reached through other means, right? So whether censorship is the only answer or whether you can have it in proactive disclosure, whether you can have a diverse information and so on. So that's the basis for the government policy for me in this setting. And also we didn't touch on the protection of whistleblowers, which is uh, it's become problematic in this context, not just in the UK and also in China, in other countries, so who are really bringing information from, from the particular policy making or from the hospitals and so on, and comprehensive protection of the whistleblowers and the people who will come forward um, and uh, will blow a whistle on certain issues is, is crucial here as well. And I think CIJ works on this extensively, so something to campaign for as well. And that kind of that is, my point. Um, whistleblowers. I'm in touch with a number of doctors of different kinds who are, you know, in the front line. And they are all giving me what I regard as, you know, important and sometimes quite shocking information, which runs counter to what the general media narrative has been. They are all absolutely petrified that if I use their information, there must be absolutely nothing that could possibly lead to their being identified, because if they are, they will lose their jobs. And you know the, the, the pressure on employees of the National Health Service now not to disclose information is extreme. We all remember the brave young doctor who lost his life very early on in the crisis in Wuhan yeah. and, and had been denounced uh, in, in the Chinese media for, you know, they were saying spreading disinformation. And now, of course, he's been rehabilitated, but unfortunately he's, he's deceased. Actually, the way we're treating our own doctors is no different. They are not allowed to participate in the debate in this country because the monopoly of information is held by the government and it won't let them speak. Is this the beginning of more censorship or, or will we get over this after coronavirus? What's, how does the future look for you? Well, I don't think it's the beginning. I think it's the continuation and the intensification of something that's been going on for some time. And I think clearly there have been problems with social media, there have been problems with the British government, which I've already alluded to. And I think it's been getting worse really since uh, Labour lost power in 2010 in the UK. Um, I think there is a great danger that this will continue. And, um, you know, there is um, the, one of the great Supreme Court justices uh, in the United States, I think it was Justice Brandeis said, um, absolute, he said, power is delightful. 
absolute power is absolutely delightful, which of course is, is a, um, you know, a version of, of Lord Acton's famous dictum, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But yes, power is delightful. Absolute power is absolutely gorgeous. And you can just see some people in the British government now loving every moment. Matt Hancock, he's had the time of his life. You can see him popping up in the House of Commons two or three times a week with a great grin on his face, and he thinks he's had a fantastic pandemic. Well, I've got news for you, Mr. Hancock, you haven't. A lot of people think you've done a pretty terrible job, but it's been much more difficult to scrutinize that job because of the restrictions on the flow of information that you and your colleagues have imposed. I think it's critical that we do not let this be, you know, another large step in this spiral, um, which I think, you know, it, 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 there is every reason to fear that it will do. And I think we have to have, you know, we, people talk about the great reset after the pandemic. The most important reset is to reset democracy, indeed to restore democracy in this crucial respect of the free flow of information and free speech. Mm -hmm. And also, if you remember the beginning of this pandemic in January or February, the narrative in the media was that this is going to be Chernobyl for China, like this is going to be freedom for China, this will like kill the Chinese government and we'll have this great freedom in China. And look at a couple months later in the Western world, we have emergency powers, we have uh, all kinds of like restrictions on freedom of expression and other rights. So that's kind of future looks bleak in this kind of short period of time, which should be an issue for pause for all of us, how quickly this narrative changed in few months. But also, like, you know, for, for me and for Article 19 as a free speech organization, we really, like, advocate for all this, okay, in the pandemic and in this kind of situation, it's really unprecedented in the peacetime, and so are the measures. But we really need to make sure that this legislation, which is adopted for emergency powers, doesn't stand. That governments do not, uh, um, do not adopt national security measures to deal with the crisis, and that all the responses are based on the human rights protection and uh, the, the freedom of expression and free flow of information, and right to information, protection of whistleblower, and all these rights in freedom of expression package are fully protected. So that's okay, so that's the point here. One of the most disturbing things of this crisis in Britain is that virtually unreported, virtually unnoticed, as the pandemic has unfolded, we have seen a simultaneous move by the government to enshrine certain measures which will gravely weaken those human rights protections, which will destroy the very notion of, you know, Article 10 and, and what it involves. Mm -hmm. um, so we see this new commission which wishes to review the idea of judicial review, which basically means weaken it and water it down. Now we see in the Daily Telegraph at the weekend moves to uh, change the name of and water down the powers of the Supreme Court. Everything the government is doing seems to be trending in one direction, away from scrutiny, away from accountability, away from challenge, towards authoritarianism. And I think this is the longer term crisis. We are dealing with a, with a government whose reflexes are all authoritarian. And, you know, I have never known this in my lifetime. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is the big, big challenge for uh, the, the post-pandemic period. And it's not just UK, like, you know, this shift towards authoritarianism and like restrictions and so on. It's been going on in Europe for several several years, like look at Hungary, Poland, you know, countries in Central Asia and so on. So it's a, it's a really global trend, which we as a free community think to be really on par and advocate against it. And then also see further, further entrenchment of censorship. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real threat by state by, as well as by the companies. You know, we've talked about big tech, Google, Facebook, Twitter. We've talked about the government in Westminster. We've talked about Donald Trump. But actually, how about all the other things that, that don't get talked about? You know, and, and perhaps, perhaps these things, perhaps big tech and the government are kind of, you know, to, to, you know it, as you have suggested, clamping down on free speech. But actually, how about, um, at least we're talking about that, how about the Welsh government, the Scottish government, the WHO, uh, local councils, uh, any number of other organisations and, you know, uh, international groups, do you think that 
this is a much broader, wider problem, or is this a kind of, are we mainly concerned with a few central actors in this? Well, it's a, it's a global problem. I mean, the world doesn't revolve around the UK government as much as they might no, want to think. Uh, yeah, because we, this, is, this is happening, this is happening globally and all uh, over, over citizens and they can say and, uh, companies as well. So it's a global problem. So I don't know what the question is exactly. What did you? Well, I, what I'm saying is, is this just about governments and big tech? Or is this also about you know, local government, uh, com you know, smaller companies, councils, uh, international organisations like the WHO. I I should we be looking more broadly at this issue? Well, you know, um, I don't know about local councils. Um, I, I actually find that local government is one of the areas where sometimes they are still a bit more responsive. Um, obviously, organisations like the WHO, I mean, by definition, what are they? They're supranational national uh, bureaucracies um, and they have, they're, they're not very accountable. And, and let's not forget, you know, the current head of the WHO is a former Ethiopian government minister, uh, a, a country with a human rights record that is, shall we say, uh, is somewhat spotty. Um, and indeed, you know, if you want to research this, you will find allegations against him personally in terms of uh, concealing um, atrocities against the Oromo minority in Ethiopia, which are extremely disturbing. Um, but, you know, there is another factor in all of this, which, uh, you know, it's a completely, you know, it's slightly off to one side, but I think it relates to it. There is a general tendency amongst, I think, younger people to flee debate we hear about you know piling on uh, people you know tend to characterize it as you know the woke and all this but the fact is on the left and on the right um there is a there is a an enormous reluctance to actually take on what an opponent or or somebody who you know it, it, it has a disagreement with you about a, on a whole range of issues it's almost as if people can't cope any longer with discussion, with rational argument, with um, well-informed discussion. And so very quickly online, you know, people take one position, people take another, and, 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 and then they start abusing each other. And I think that is another sort of area of all this, which we, we need to, to, to try to, to move back from, because uh, democracy can't function very well if you demonize your opponents. Now, you, you know, you see on the streets of America in the most terrifying way with uh, militias carrying extremely powerful automatic weapons. Uh, we're not there yet in Europe, but um, the, the sort of mutual loathing which that expresses is there in Europe. And it's, it's also another factor in this, which is, I find, uh, very worrying. Yeah, and Barbara, you, well, you I don't saying, know whether this was your no. question about like accountability of international institutions, and there is also a lot of desired net, and we know how they how they make decisions as well, or like you know, transparency and so on. There's a lot of like problems with all of these institutions. I don't know particularly WHO, but there's a lot of criticism. Let's say also human rights councils, like who are the states there and, uh, and stuff, and who sits on those institutions. And, uh, which are the deserving governments and, and so on, but it's not the point of this discussion here. But, you know, I think we need more international cooperation and we also need to improve the systems of accountability for the state, for each other and to international community and also for those companies you touched upon. So, yes, it's, 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 it's difficult, but it doesn't mean that we are going to give up, right? And I think that in discussions like okay. this are kind of useful to inform people about what's going on and how they can like, you know, get involved in those institutions and also on a normative level, what kind of rules are adopted, which the governments then should adopt and follow. And I think this is important as well. But you know, human rights are universal. We don't need much difference there. We just need the states to respect them and, and comply with them, which in most cases is not the case. Okay, well, I think, um, We'll, we'll wrap it up there, um, but thank you both very much for your time. Um, it's, been, it's been great talking to you. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, brilliant.